Hello learners, welcome back to the course on labor welfare and industrial relations. Today we look into the dispute settlement machineries that are included as part of the Industrial Disputes Act. So if you have uh, gone through the previous lecture, you will understand that we are going through the Industrial Disputes Act uh, 1947 in the module 3 specifically. We have looked into what the act is all about, why there was need for such an act. We have looked into the, the aspects or the salient features of the particular act. Today we specifically look into the dispute settlement machineries available with these acts, specifically Industrial Disputes Act 1947. I am Dr. Abraham Sirlisek. I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology. Guwahati. So, when we look into the Industrial Dispute Act 1947 specifically, it came into force in uh, 1st April 1947. The objective was specifically to prevent uh, and settlement of industrial disputes and uh, providing certain safeguards uh, to the workers. We have seen extensively uh, what those safeguards are specifically. Now, we will try to understand what the machineries are when it comes to dispute. The act contains 40 sections divided into 7 chapters, that is what the, uh, the status is. Now when you look into the Industrial Dispute Amendment Act 2010, bigger improvement into the act came up in 2010. So the particular aspect which came up as an interesting uh, scenario or interesting point in the Industrial Disputes Act Amendment Act 2010, the wage ceiling of the worker specifically working in a supervisory capacity has been enhanced from 1,600 rupees per month to 10,000 rupees per month. So more than that, the act provides direct access for the workmen to the labor court or tribunal in case of disputes arising out of section 2A pertaining to retrenchment, discharge, dismissal or even termination of service. So there is a level of job security that is coming into picture with the Industrial Disputes Act Amendment 2010. It provides to establish a grievance redressal machinery within the industrial establishment having 20 or more workmen and also it is critical to note that the amended act provides to empower the labor court or tribunal as the case may be to execute their awards orders of settlements arrived at as a decree of civil court. So when you look into the Industrial Disputes Act, let us understand the machinery for the settlement of Industrial Disputes Act and this is the theme of today's lecture. When you look into the different possible machineries that exist within the ambit of this act, first one works committee, section 3, conciliation officers, section 4, board of conciliation, uh, section 5, Courts of Inquiry Section 6 and Labor Courts Section 7, Tribunals coming under Section 7A, National Tribunals Section 7B. Now let us look into these in detail. When you look into uh, specifically the Works Committee Section 3, we understand that the, it is applicable to the industrial establishment in which 100 or more workmen are employed or have been employed any day in the preceding 12 months. So specifically what we understand is that the works committee consists of representative of employers and workmen engaged in the establishment. So basically when we look into uh, the specific case of works committee, let us say the number of representatives committee shall uh, have or should not be less than the number of representatives of all the employers. If we look into the duties of the works committee specifically, what we understand is that it is in existence due to various reasons or to fulfill various duties uh, like to promote measures for securing and preserving amity and good relations between the employers and workmen because that is why we have the representation from both the employers and workmen to have a harmonious association, harmonious linkage between both. Another important duty of this works committee could be to comment upon matters of their common interest or concern. So there might be issues where you know there could be a convergence. So why not bring into uh, those convergence at an earlier stage and uh, resolve any pending conflict amicably or 
to not get to a conflict situation at the uh, first place itself. So this could be one of the important duty. Another could be what I fathom here is or I understand here is that to endeavor to compose any material difference of opinion in respect of such matters. So basically when you are looking into the, the entire duties of work committee, we see that these might be some of the critical duties of the work committee. So we see that there are a combination of employers and workmen that engaged uh, in uh, segregation, they come into and work as works committee and this is what brings out or it, this comes out as one of the topmost dispute resolution machinery under the act. The second important aspect which is covered under section 4 of the act is the conciliation officer. So the appropriate government may appoint such number of persons, the wordings are quite clear, such number of persons as it thinks fit to be conciliation officers by notification in the official gazette. So the conciliation officer mainly holds the conciliation proceedings in a prescribed manner. The, the conciliation officer, he or the, the team of officers investigate the dispute and settlement. They finally send report on settlement of the dispute to the appropriate government together with a memorandum of settlement signed by the parties to dispute. Now, if we understand the conciliation officers closely, if we read section 4 closely to be precise, there are certain duties that are mentioned of conciliation officers and uh, some of them uh, would be that in every, let us say in every industrial dispute existing or even apprehended, the conciliation officer shall hold the conciliation proceedings in a prescribed manner. So this is something which we have already understood uh, with respect to our discussion on the conciliation officer. So for uh, settling that he or the team may investigate and the conciliation officer shall technically you know send a report and more importantly if no such settlement because there is a possibility because every conflict need not be resolved in the first place or prima facie there could be situations where the conciliation officers fail or there might be long standing tussle that is existing and it cannot be you know solved in one sitting. So if no such settlement is arrived at the conciliation, conciliation officer shall as soon as practically uh, after the close of investigation typically send to the appropriate government a full report, a detailed report setting forth the steps taken by him for ascertaining the facts and circumstances relating to the dispute uh, specifically and bringing about a settlement thereof together with a full statement of such facts and all the circumstances and the reasons on the account of which in his opinion specifically a settlement could not be arrived at. So we see that the conciliation officer tries his or her maximum to solve the issue that is what he, is, or he or she is for but if there are situations like no settlement situations are arriving he has or she has to take a clear stand and send the report to the government and take the necessary action. So if on consideration of let us say uh, the failure of report, let us look into the worst case scenario referred here. Government is satisfied that there is a case for reference to a board or maybe a labor court or tribunal or any such competent authority. Uh, that could be made uh, or forwarded for a reference. So where the appropriate government does not make such a reference, it shall record and communicate to the parties whoever are concerned. So this is something that uh, brings in the, the essential uh, functioning of conciliation office or what he or she is liable to do. And specifically we look into section 12 a report uh, under section 12 um, mainly it, it is uh, you know categorically stated there shall be submitted within 14 days of commencement of the conciliation proceedings or with such shorter period as may be fixed by the appropriate government. So there are certain uh, specifications given even for the report submission and this is the vital process that the conciliation officers have to undertake. When you look into the board of conciliation, uh, board of conciliation takes over when conciliation fails specifically. The functions of the board of conciliation are same as those of conciliation officer. There is hardly any difference. The difference is a board shall consist of a chairman 
and two or four other members. So, it's, it's a larger entity where, uh, you know, there will be greater authority and there will be greater deliberation that would be warranted in such a situation and an informed decision possibly could be obtained. So, objective is clear, investigation and settlement of individual disputes as in case of the previous case, the board shall submit its report here within two months of the date on which the dispute was referred to it or within such shorter period as may be fixed by the appropriate government. So, these are some of the uh, specific aspects or salient features, you know, concerned with the Board of Conciliation. So, again, um, if no such settlement is arrived at, that's, that's interesting to note that if no such uh, settlement is arrived at, the section is very clear on this, the Board shall as soon as practical after the close of investigation, send to the appropriate government a detailed report on the steps taken by the board for ascertaining the facts and circumstances relating to the dispute and for bringing about a settlement thereof, so that the report shall also contain a full statement of all the facts and circumstances and even the reasons on account of which, in its opinion, a settlement could not be arrived. So, there ends the the function of Board of Conciliation, it cannot uh, shy away from performing its duties, it, it has to forward uh, the report if no such settlement is arrived. Another important machinery when it comes to the Industrial Disputes Act is the Court of Enquiry under Section 6. So, court shall inquire into the matters referred to and report thereon to the appropriate government ordinarily within a period of six months. So, the duration is increasing, the cases might be a little more serious or severe from the commencement of its inquiry. So, what we see is that the court consists of generally two or more members, one of them shall be appointed as the chairman. So, basically the appropriate uh, government may as occasion arises by notification the official gazette constitute a court of inquiry for inquiring into any matter appearing to be connecting with or relevant to a particular industrial dispute. So, the court of inquiry uh, happens to be another important machinery. A court shall specifically inquire into uh, all the matters generally referred to it and uh, obviously, report thereon to the appropriate government ordinarily within a period of six months. So, this is what exists as another important machinery within the ambit of the Act. Then we have the Labour Courts. Section 7 categorically covers the Labour Courts and it is being defined as a mechanism where a certain level of justice or certain level of dispute resolution happens. So, when, when uh, the, the requirement is to adjudicate the following disputes relating to matters specified in the second schedule, the main aspects would be the propriety or legality of an order passed by an employer under the standing order, the application and interpretation of the, the particular standing order that is existing, discharge or dismissal of workmen, including reinstatement of or grant of relief to workmen wrongfully dismissed withdrawal of any customer concession or privilege and finally illegality or otherwise uh, something related to strike or lockout. So, these are some of the specific aspects coming under the prerogative of the labor courts. So, generally when we see the labor courts, the labor courts shall hold its proceedings expeditiously, that is the key requirement there and shall as soon as practicable on the conclusion thereof uh, submit its, its particular award to the appropriate government and that is uh, you mentioned in the section 15. So, these are uh, some of the machineries which we were discussing, uh, the fifth one being the labor courts. Now, let us look into something which is uh, very much common and uh, um, you know very much uh, communicated within the media which are the tribunals, a uh, section 7a. Industrial tribunals have a wider jurisdiction and this makes them you know more popular than a labor court. So, it shall discharge judicial functions though it is not a court. So, this is something which has to be taken into consideration and when you are looking into or comparing with other uh, judicial bodies, it do not have that much of power, it is but it is having a wider jurisdiction and following specific area comes under its jurisdiction. One, wages including the period and mode of payment, 
the compensatory and other elements specific to the payment and the benefits associated with the work of the particular individual. Uh, there could be, you know, considerations emerging out of hours of work and the rest intervals specifically because it is not only the, the monetary aspects but also the rest associated or the, or the leave, uh, you know, hours of work and rest intervals that are very critical. Leaves are also considered, leaves with wages and holidays, they are also, uh, you know, a classic uh, point which, which comes under uh, the jurisdiction of tribunals. Bonus or maybe profit sharing, even PF and gratuity, they come under the jurisdiction of uh, tribunals. You have rules of disciplines and even factors or matters related to retrenchment of workers are also part of uh, this jurisdiction. And uh, that said, when you are looking into the, the duties specifically of tribunals, you should make a note of the fact that the duties of a tribunal are same as are same as those of a labor court specifically. So you see that this is an extension but it is having a wider jurisdiction because we have seen an exhaustive list of the factors or the areas coming under the jurisdiction of tribunals. Now let's look into the national tribunal which is described under section 7 class B. It adjudicate industrial dispute which uh, in the opinion of uh, the central government uh, involve questions of national importance specifically or are of such a nature that industrial establishments situated in more than one state are likely to be interested in or affected by such disputes. So the presiding officer of a national tribunal shall be the judge of a high court. So this is something which is very particular to national tribunals only. When you look into the duties specified under subsection 2A of section 10 and specifically section 15, where an industrial dispute has been referred to a labor court, tribunal or national tribunal for adjudication, please note, it shall hold its proceedings expeditiously and shall within the period specified in the order referring such industrial disputes or the further period. So, extended under the second provision of the subsection which I mentioned, subsection 2A of section 10, submit its award to the appropriate government as such. So, this would be yet again another important aspect or important, this would be uh, another critical machinery which would be existing within the ambit of the Disputes Act for solving industrial disputes. Now, when you are walking through the Industrial Disputes Act, we have seen a large number of possibilities of emergence of industrial disputes. Now, we might not be able to stop disputes in the first place, but what, what we can do is essentially we can address those uh, uh, disputes or we can at least put a check on the on the particular issue. So these machineries which we have discussed today, uh, ranging from individual conciliation officers to a tribunal to court, all these aspects are critical machineries that come under the ambit to prevent or to mitigate industrial disputes from flaring up, from increasing its momentum and going out of control. So please note, Industrial Disputes Act essentially has the particular provisions of these machineries to control specifically the, the disputes and to keep a check on these disputes and uh, you know, ensure that it does not go out of control. Thank you for listening to me patiently. We'll come up with more details of Industrial Disputes Act in the next few lectures uh, in the Module 3. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.